perception and communication. Take a look at the picture below. Picture the circle as red and round. In two words or less, write down what you see. Ignore the arrow. It's there as a guide. What did you write? The most common answer is a red dot. But only 33% of observers wrote that. A next is a red circle. 18%. The question has produced many different answers. Someone from the medical school wrote down streptococcus. About 7% wrote white space. More than 40% wrote something other than red. Here is a partial list of answers. A red dot, Japanese flag Rudolf, upper right, Eyeball, streptococcus, black dot, blood drop, target, stoplight, white space. How could people have so many different answers to the same simple questions? Put another way, there is widespread disagreement over what people saw. Multiply this by 1,000. We have litigation. Multiply it by a million. We have armed conflict. It's all on the same continent. In addition, almost everyone processed a small amount of the information inherent in the question. I pointed to the red dot was said, write down what you see. Clearly, there is much more white space than a red dot. And if you argue that the question focused you on the red dot, why do 7% of the people see white space? Perhaps the biggest cause of negotiation failure worldwide is communication failure. And the single biggest cause of communication failure is misperception. Two people look at the same picture, but each sees a different part, and as is too often the case in the world. They will kill each other fighting over different parts of the same picture. But causes different perceptions. First, we are all different people. So we are interested in different things. We have different values and emotional makeups. And different people influence us. We experience and observe different information. Often we ignore or dismiss information that doesn't fit. In argument or negotiations, we selectively collect evidence that supports our views. We also selectively remember our memories, color our perceptions. These are the main reasons for virtually all human conflict since the beginning of time. Their importance cannot be overestimated. There are two women in the well-known picture on this page, an old woman and a young man. The old woman is in profile, with her mouth at the horizontal line, just above the whole coat, her large nose left above her mouth, and her eyes just below her black hair, a uh, young woman seen from behind is looking away. Her necklace is the old woman's mouth, her chin is the old woman's nose, her ear is the old woman's eye. <clears throat> In some of my classes, 
the students knew that two women in this picture when we first displayed it. I passed a copy of each half of the picture. The old woman was the young woman to different halves of the class. Then I took the combined picture of the screen at the front of the room and asked people to stare at their heart for five minutes. Next, I put the combined picture back onto the screen at the front. What do you think happened? Almost no one could see the other half. If people have trouble seeing a picture, they know it's there. After seeing a contact image for five minutes, how much trouble does one culture have seeing another culture's point of view after seeing the same picture for a thousand years? The perception gap for many people, the other person's perception is not there at all on all kinds of subjects. Many people think that others who don't see their point of view are being thick, stubborn, or unreasonable. That's not necessarily so. The problem is usually much deeper than that. Often, the things you hold so firmly and clearly are invisible to the other party they don't exist. So to, to persuade people with a different perception, you must start with the notion that your facts, your ideas, thoughts, and perception are invisible, invisible to them. What you see so clearly, the other party may not see at all. What do you think happens when school children in the Middle East see a map of their neighborhood, of their region for all of their young lives without Israel in it? <clears throat> when someone finally tells them that Israel exists, they don't believe it. Even using ordinary language can lead to dramatically different perception. A client worked in the marketing department of Polygram Records in New York City. After he and other colleagues argued one day at work, they realized that each was using the term marketing differently. One of them thought it was closer to sales. The other thought it was closer to strategy, and yet they sat near each other in the same department for years. Their differing perception affected how they approached their jobs, spent resources, dealt with clients, indeed spent their time. Clever lawyers negotiating complex contracts know they need a section defining terms used in the agreement. They realize that if the most ordinary words are open to interpretation, if parties have different ideas of what the same words mean, the entire agreement can be in jeopardy because there is no meeting of the minds. This is even more important in everyday language when opportunities for misinterpretation are best, but people are rarely defined the terms for their talks. Even more rarely do they 
question something that seemed ambiguous. Examples of this interpretation about the client said our 430,000 fee was too much for the architectural service package being offered, said Anup Misra, a founder of a real estate development firm. He wouldn't tell us what he, he had in mind. Finally, the client was asked to define architecture service package. It turned out the client wanted fewer services than outlined in the initial fee. The final fee was $230,000 for half the scope of work dispute served. Bob Brown was dissatisfied with his son's high school grades after closely questioning his son, Alex, Bob found out that Alex thought his grades were good enough to get into the colleague of his choice. Bob introduced his 14-year-old to a colleague admission counselor who told Alex they were not. Rather than argue with Alex over who was right, Bob helped to show him what the real standards to get into colleagues were by using a respected third party. It worked perfectly, said Bob, or had science advice at more. Alex got into the University of Wisconsin and maintained a 3.8 average as an electrical engineering student. I taught a three-day negotiation workshop a few years ago for executives in Riyadh, South Arabia. One executive who had lived in the United States said, you know, when you are in a restaurant in the United States and you want some more coffee, you raise your cup and sort of rub it back and forth. The waiter comes over and refills your cup. But if you do that in South Arabia, the waiter takes your cup away and they think they understood you perfectly. Imagine a day full of different perceptions like this. And millions of different ways people get into personal conflicts because they haven't asked the question, do they mean what I think they are saying? In psychology, this mistake is called fundamental attribution error. You assume that everyone else reacts to things they want that you do. When you say to someone else with some force, it's hot in here, and they reply, unquote. The wrong answer is to say you are wrong. People react to things in different ways. The more you are exquisitely conscious of this in all of your encounters, the less conflict you will have and the more problems you will solve. This means that their perceptions are more important than your proposals. That is, if you want to persuade them. Not communicating effectively in companies is expensive. More expenses, frustration, low efficiency and service, loss of customers, poor response time, 
including to competitive grace in ability to capitalize on the collective wisdom, lost opportunities less time to build the organization. One major company calculated the loss as 3.5 hours per worker per week. Millions of dollars per year for even 500 worker company. Closing the perception gap, how do we solve the, these problems of this communication and perception? The first thing you must realize is that these problems occur all the time everywhere. First, question the language being used to see if you both mean the same thing. Jocelyn Donut, an executive director at J.P. Morgan Chase, told her to ear all this analysis at that time. Now it is time for a story from Aunt Jocelyn. Immediately, her niece said to stories. After some back and forth, Jocelyn finally asked her niece why she wanted two stories. Because I'm not tired was the answer. They settled on one longer story. They each had a different perception of story length. From now on, when you have a conflict with someone, ask yourself, what am I, am I perceiving? What are they perceiving? Is there a mismatch? If so, why? You may have done this in an ad hoc, unstructured way at time in your time. Now you should make such question a specific conscious part of your negotiation repertoire. This means that you need to understand both parties' biases, try to articulate their perception, and then explain yours. Here are two statements with the same words. Statement number one. I am going to New York City. Where are you going? Statement number two. Where are you going? I'm going to New York City. Experience show that statement number two will be heard by the other person much more often than sentence number one. When you ask someone for their perception first, you value them. So they are then much more interested in listening to what you have to say. Two sentences, same words, different order. There is a reason I said these are tools are invisible to those who don't already know them. And this is why it is generally senseless to interrupt someone. When someone is interrupted, the tapes are still playing in their head. Mostly, they don't hear you listening, declines further. If they get mad about the interruption, what you must do first in a negotiation is get them ready to listen to you. Most people start with the facts. My proposal is to offer you $200,000 for this house based on market conditions. But as we have seen, the facts comprise less than 10% of the region. Why people reach agreement or not? Other people will begin a negotiation by explaining the rational interests. Housing prices are continuing to fall. 
so it's best to stay now. But neither fact nor rationality speaks to most of the people in the world. Rather, we need to start at the beginning. Is the other person even ready to listen to me? To know that, you have to understand the picture in their heads, their perceptions and feelings, how they view you and the rest of the world. If you don't, you don't have a starting point. You are just walking around in the dark. In the example above, try something like this. Hi, this is such a nice house you have. How long have you lived here? Explain your perception is the last thing you should do. First, learn their perception. Tim McClough, an account manager at a major life insurance company, was told by a broker that the company's prices were 15% too high. Tim questioned the broker who closely about his perceptions. What about the high prices didn't the broker like? The broker didn't think that we would make him look good to his own customers, Tim realized. So they provided a package of additional services to the broker with a blended price. One good way to find out the other person or party's perception is to ask a question. In a negotiation, questions are far more powerful than statements. A statement commits you to whatever you said. It doesn't get you any information, and it gives the other side something to throw things at. You become the target. A question, on the other hand, doesn't commit you, usually gets you information, and gives you something to throw things at if you wish. Question focus the other side on themselves. Almost everything you say in a negotiation should be a question. It helps you find out if they really intended to communicate on your first thing you they meet. Damien Olive, a senior investment officer at the International Finance Corporation World Bank in Washington, D.C., wasn't getting financial information or even return phone calls from a Mexican company in which the bank had invested. Instead of threatening, Damian thought about what problems the Mexican company might be having. He sent a note asking if everything was okay. We found out that the client didn't have the time, money, or people to collect the financial information immediately, he said. The firm was embarrassed. In the end, the company offered to provide a different information at a time. An unnecessary blow up was avoided. Try turning your statement into question instead of saying this isn't a failure try something do you think this is a failure instead of saying to your son clean your room try saying could you tell me why your room isn't clean now you might like the answer but remember the negotiation isn't over with the answer to your question it isn't over until you decide it is. Questions also give the other party a better chance to participate in the conversation. You might learn something valuable at the least by asking them for their perception first. You have value to them. 
Jack Douglas had tried unsuccessfully to convince a customer to use his company's new website to order products. With this existing system, the customer had to visit the store in person several times a day to pick up chemical products. With the new internet system, the customer could order only once a week by computer. He got very angry, Jack said. He said he would no longer buy from us if he had to use the internet. So Jack tactfully asked him question about his buying habits. I found out his your issue, Jack said. It was a people issue. He liked the human contact. He wanted to protect the jobs of our local people. Jack explained that the new internet system would not take the jobs of the people he liked. He and he could still go see them for advice. It would, however, make the company's inventory allocation more efficient and result in fewer invoices and less extra work for their for his bodies. The customer began ordering on the internet. Many people say they don't have the patience for this. Actually, conducting interpersonal relations this way saves a lot of time of the long term. The dialogue becomes less hostile, less emotional, and eventually more persuasive. Jordan Robinson received an unexpected phone call from an attractive woman who lived nearby. She invited him to lunch. She showed up with two female friends, all of them shouting him with compliments and questions. Flattered, he answered them. When he finally became skeptical and started asking questions back, he found out they were trying to sell him a seminar on life improvement for $450. When he declined, high pressure sales tactics ensued. I wasted two hours by not asking questions, he said. You don't have to be obnoxious asking questions. Many people assume their question can be seen as hostile. But there are all sorts of ways to ask a question. A favorite of mine is the tactic of the summer dated TV character Colombo. Help me out here. I'm confused. It's a powerful way to ask a question asking for the other person's help. Here's another powerful question stated in the collaborative terms. Please tell me where I'm wrong here. If they tell you where you are wrong, you get information that help you in the next negotiation. Again, the negotiation isn't over until you say it is. If the other person can tell you where you are wrong, you become more persuasive. I'm forever asking people to tell me where I'm wrong, from a colleague to the CEO. It's a small thing, but remember, negotiations are very sensitive to the exact words used. It is the precision that matters, God, not the devil is in the details. The more precise you are in communicating your thoughts, hopes, dreams, feelings, and information in general, the less chance there is of miscommunication and of failed 
Sehr gut, Spech. The communication gap and how to fix it. At the beginning, of a course, I taught at Columbia Business School. I asked, how do I get to Broadway from here? Someone said, go down 118th Street until you reach Broadway. I then asked, how do I get to 118th Street? They said, go north across the campus. I responded, how do I get to the campus and which way is north? Then, well, go outside the buildings. Me, how do I get out of the building and by which exit? Then, take the elevator to the first floor. Me, where's the, where's the elevator? Then, leave the classroom Me, to each of the two doors. Once we painfully went through this exercise, it became clear why we miscommunicate so often, leading to conflict and prejudice. We assume certain knowledge and pictures in the head of the other party. But that knowledge and those perceptions are often not there. You have to start at the beginning and go step by step at their pace, not yours, if you want to persuade them. Here are the basic components of effective communication. Always communicate, listen, and ask questions. Value, don't blame them. Summarize often. Do not do a role reversal. Be dispassionate. Articulate goals. Be firm without damaging the relationship. Look for small signals. Discuss perceptual differences. Find out how they make a commitment, consult before deciding, focus on what you can control, and avoid debate who is right. First things first, you must communicate. This goes against the conventional wisdom of it is ignored to bad effect, except in the most extreme cases, if they have harmed a loved one. For example, you should, not, should try to talk with the other person even if you hate them. That's because if you don't talk to them, it means you don't even value them enough to listen to what they have to say. This makes the principal alternatives no agreement to litigation or war. If you talk to them, you can get information you can use either to get a deal or to use your extreme statement against them before third parties. What you might think about the other person, including your enemy, isn't it smarter to find out what they are thinking before making a decision about what to do, even if it is to attack? Talking is a sign of strength, not talking is a sign of weakness. Yet, that is exactly the opposite of conventional wisdom. I'm amazed at the number of labor management negotiators, coaching negotiators, attorneys, dip diplomats, and leaders of all sorts who, when things are not going well, work out that guarantees that things won't go well. How does that make any sense at all? Yet people all over the world wreck a negotiation by working out, thinking they are doing the right thing. If you are afraid of being seen as weak, why not say, hi, I'm here to hear any concessions you might want to make. It depends on how things are framed. In 2002, former Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon said that 
he should have killed Yasir Araya Arafat, the head of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, 20 years before. The statement by itself did not make Sharon a bad negotiator. What made him a bad negotiator, at least in that instance, is what Sharon didn't say. Sharon should have said, Arafat, I hate you. I should have killed you 20 years ago. We had to talk. If Sharon wanted to reach a deal to end the violence, then he needed to talk with Arafat. No matter how the two felt about each other, this also means talking with all manners of characters as long as you can get information from them that could improve the situation. That includes people who might otherwise sympathize with a terrorist. If you're worried that talking to them will legitimize them, take incremental steps about who negotiation harm each friend. The FBI, National Security Agency, and other federal agencies concerned with hostages and terrorists have sent people to a negotiation workshop at water to learn these tools. Some of the military in Afghanistan is now using these communication tools to build a coalition against the Taliban. I'll include more on this in Chapter 15, Public Issues. Here is another counterintuitive communication tool. Many negotiators demand concession from the other party to start or restart negotiation. This looks good on television and portrays the negotiators as strong and tough to their constituents. But it is often ineffective words. It creates hostility and sometimes retaliation. Unless I have some form of a relationship with you, I might, I'm not going to willingly give you anything. You want a concession from me for the privilege of talking to you? My first response is, go jump in the lab. If we develop a relationship during our negotiation, then concession might be in order, including something for an injury you suffered yesterday. But at the start of negotiation, when we have no trust or relationship, no way. This notion of give me a concession and then we will talk, push the car before the horse, take first proposal later. Talk first and proposals later. Their words and perception are more important than yours. This brings up the second point about the list on this page, listening to the other side and asking questions. Uh, validating their perception what you say is less important than what they say. What you think you said is less important than what they think they've heard. In order to persuade them, you need to listen to what they are saying, verbally and non-verbally. The more you try to blame them, the less they will listen. The more you value them, the more they will listen. This is true for virtually everyone, including children, government, officials, sales reps, and customers. An uncle of mine, a very successful insurance salesman, would go to see a potential client and ask a couple of questions. They talk for the better part of an hour. At the end of, the, at the end of that time, 
a client would usually buy insurance for. Are you a good conversationalist? They would say to my uncle. Most people persuade themselves by talking if the other party insults and lets you know the correct response is tell me more. The more you know about a person, the better you can see how they think, the better you will be able to visualize the picture in their heads, and the better negotiate you will be. Not doing this can have disastrous result. It is instructive to look around and see the number of visible and costly mistakes made because experts are wrong. Much has been written about the error that German authorities made during the talk taking of Israeli Olympic athletes in 1972. The authority in Munich were antagonistic, divisive, and contemptuous. German sharpshooters opened fire on the terrorists with the hostages still at gunpoint. The terrorists killed 11 hostages. The Russian used the same tactics in negotiations with the Chachin Yan. Warlord in 1995, resulting in the death of more than a hundred hostages. Some years ago, a hostage negotiator from a major Sunbelt City police force came to Walton and told of an unsuccessful hostage negotiation that ended with a highly emotional man killing his girlfriend. She had just broke on with him and he was holding her at gun point. The hostage negotiator used harsh tactics from their by the book training, such as guessing the apartment. As noted above, such tactics tend to destabilize people and make them more emotional, more unpredictable, and often more extreme. Instead, why did the hostage negotiator not think hard about the man's perception? He was clearly distraught about his girlfriend's leave. He needed to be calmed down by being valued as a human being. In a discussion after the negotiator's talk, I suggested that the hostage negotiator might have offered that his girlfriend still loved him, things could be worked out. If the girlfriend was astute, she might have been have been able to go along with this, this man was distraught, distraught. He very much wanted to hear comforting words. The situation might have been sad. The hostage negotiator turned us sad, realizing the outcome might have been different. In recent years, many hostage negotiators have given up such extreme tactics. But now, many negotiators in all kinds of situations use first niceness to cause others to give up things not in their interest. If people think they are being manipulated by first flattery, then emotion, instability, and danger result, just as if the old hostile tactics were being used. This is different from the Sunbelt 
caused his suggestion above. Since the, the strategy was designed to help the parties not hurt them, value them, don't blame them, studies though with both children and adults over the past 50 years show that blaming people reduces performance and motivation. Praising people, on the other hand, improves both. I mentioned the value them in Chapter 2. Here is the communication part. Following are the results of studies showing just how much negativity is a part of the repertoire of less skilled and presumably less successful negotiators. Compared to skilled negotiators, average negotiators cast blame three times as much, consider have the creative options, look for common ground less than a third of the time, share much less information, make half the number of comments about the long term, and make more than four times the number of creative choice comments that irritate the other side, more negativity, less negotiation success period. Summarize what you are hearing. Some of what you think you are hearing with some frequency and play back to the other side in your own words, it values them and makes sure you are both still on the same page. They can see that you are listening to them, make it more likely that they will listen to you. And if you don't have it quite right, they can correct a misunderstanding. To emphasize just because you think you are being crystal clear doesn't mean the other side understands it the same way. Whether it's your customers, friends, competition, or spouse, it also gives you a chance to package or frame information in ways that put things in perspective. As I understand it, you like our products better than theirs, but you are still buying theirs. Well, I got the highest rating in the department, but I'm not getting a bonus, while others have. Is my understanding right? Or well, you are saying, son, that even though you got B and C's on your report card, you still believe you can get into Ivy League school? How so? Citibank was charged Rory Christopher, now a Los Angeles consultant, 17.9% annual interest on her credit card. Another bank offered her 11.66%. The Citibank customer service rep will not budge. So Rory said, you are telling me that I should transfer my balance from your card with its 70.9% APR to other bank offering me 11.6%. This made it crystal clear for the seed bank rep. Rory got an 8.9% rate. Framing, paint them a picture. Rule reversal means putting yourself in the shoes of the other party. It is one of the most important tools in this book. It will give you a better idea of the other person's perception of the pressures they may be under of their dreams and 